Uh, welcome to this policy and practice seminar, which is being held jointly this time by the UCL Department of Political Science and also by the UCL Constitution Unit. My name is Alan Rennick. I'm Professor of Democratic Politics here in the Department of Political Science and also Deputy Director of the Constitution Unit, and I'm your chair for this evening. Um, and the title of tonight's event is Data-Driven Campaigning, How and Why Do Political Parties Do It? Um, there has, as I'm sure you're aware, been much discussion and some concern of late over what's often thought of, at least, as being the increasingly sophisticated use by political parties and other campaigners of uh, data to target their campaign resources and tailor their messages uh, at particular voters. Um, so we're going to be asking here today how much of that is really happening across various different democracies, and what factors shape it, what are its implications for democracy, and if concerns are justified, how can they best be addressed? And we're uh, joined by a really distinguished panel of guests this evening to discuss these issues. Our first speaker at the other end of the, of the stage here is Kate Dommett, who is Professor of Digital Politics in the Department of, Political and International, of Politics and International Relations uh, at the University of Sheffield. Kate, Kate's research focuses on digital technology and democratic politics, with a particular focus on data use, election campaigns, and regulation. She's been a special advisor to the House of Lords uh, Select Committee on Democracy and Digital Technology, and she's also currently a member of the Department of Culture, Media, and Sports College of Experts. So she's a, a person who knows things. Um, <laughs> most importantly... No one trusts experts anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have evidence that says that's not true. Um, <laughs> um, her, most importantly, her newly published book, uh, which is co-authored with Glenn Kefford and Simon Kruszynski, is called Data-Driven Campaigning and Political Parties, and it will be the foundation for our discussion this evening. Um, Dr. Miriam Sirace, immediately on my left, is lecturer in quantitative politics at the University of Kent, but currently on leave working as a political data scientist in the Labour Party's data and targeting team. She specialises in her research in quantitative research methods, European political behaviour and public opinion, gendered political behaviour, comparative political institutions and decision making, and also the politics of Brexit. So she uh, knows lots too. <laughs> and last but very, very much not least is Louise Edwards, uh, who is the Electoral Commission's Director of Regulation and Digital Transformation. She's responsible for maintaining the registers of political parties in the UK, as well as the Commission's regulatory work and its digital data technology and facilities infrastructure. This includes many things, including publishing information on funding and spending at elections and referendums, registering political parties and campaigners, enforcement work and data and information management. So, what a fantastic group of people to be discussing these issues this evening. The plan is that Kate will speak first and give us an overview of some of the findings from her book. Then Miriam and Louise will respond more briefly. Uh, then we will have a little bit of a panel discussion among ourselves before we'll open the floor to your questions. So do be thinking as we're talking away about what questions you would like to add into our conversation. And just one final note before I hand over to Kate. The whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded, as we can see uh, up at the back. And it will be posted online on the department's website, our YouTube channel, and our podcast after the event. If you speak, you will be heard in the recording. Uh, if you don't speak, you will not be heard. So just bear that in mind when you're thinking about asking a question. Um, and we'll let you know when the recording is available, and we hope that you might want to share it with others. So, without further ado, ado, over to Kate. Thank you so much, Alan. So, I have some slides. I'll just keep my eye watch there to keep myself to time. So, I'm assuming if one of the reasons you are here today is, let's see if these are working, is because you've kind of heard about what Alan referred to uh, at the beginning, which is this, there's been this real narrative for over five years now, kind of stretching back to Cambridge Analytica in 2016, around this concern around the use of data. And the Cambridge Analytica scandal, for those of you who have 
forgotten it. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to. Uh, was this kind of real scandal about the mass collection of personal data and the use of psychometric profiling to be able to target us with adverts online that were supposed to manipulate uh, the way that we were voting and it was particularly associated with the Trump election in 2016 um, and then also with the Brexit referendum. And that kind of narrative prompted a huge wave of public concern. So in the UK, we saw the Information Commissioner's Office conduct a report and an investigation into data analytics and the way that data was being used by political parties, which for people like me was fascinating because we got that kind of insider perspective of what was held by parties uh, that they were kind of compelled to disclose information for. But we also kind of saw this more broadly. We saw you know, Mark Zuckerberg hauled in front of the Senate to kind of account for what was going on on Facebook and particularly around the micro-targeting of voters. And the reason for me this is all quite interesting is because it's led to a kind of raft of um, political interest in terms of policy making and the idea that we need to clamp down on problematic data practices. So most recently, the EU Digital Services Act has um, fundamentally curtailed the targeting parameters that it's possible to use on a platform like Facebook. Now, on the surface, that sounds fantastic, but there are a number of problems with the knowledge that were being used to generate these kind of interventions. So just to kind of run you through a few of the knowledge problems that we identified when we started the book, was that firstly, a lot of the accounts of how data is being used are focused on the US. There is so much literature, and we did a systematic literature review, and kind of 80% of literature was focusing on practices in the US and particularly presidential campaigns, so not the kind of day-to-day -day down ballot. So there's kind of reasons to know, we know from previous work that the US is quite often an outlier when it comes to campaign practice. It tends to be more innovative, more well-resourced, and that it isn't necessarily replicated elsewhere. So it's interesting that we were using kind of US practice to inform EU regulation. But there were kind of a number of other problems we found as well. So a big thing with the Cambridge Analytica scandal is a lot of it was associated with the claims that were being made by the company itself. And you quite often hear a lot of claims being, you know, we need to be really concerned about like the role of bots in politics because there are companies selling, you know, bot making machines that can win you votes. It's like, well, we need to be a bit more critical about the kind of foundations of these claims and whether they're actually able to deliver the kind of manipulation that's often associated with them. But there were also kind of a lot of more academic questions, um, which were about... We didn't really know what we, we didn't have a kind of clear conception of actually what data driven campaigning was. So, some people were using it to talk about micro targeting, other people were using it to talk about kind of analytics and statistical modeling. And there was a lot of kind of ambiguity about, well, actually, what are we talking about here? Uh, you know, what even is the data that we're talking about when we use this term? And we didn't really understand how this varied. And I think that's really important because we know from so much comparative work that we don't expect electoral and um, political parties to operate in the same way in different electoral systems. There's a whole range of different contextual pressures. So diagnosing those problems quite a few years ago now, we set out to write this book with three very simple questions at the forefront. So what is data-driven campaigning? How does data-driven campaigning practice vary? And what explains those differences? And we took five cases where we kind of expected to see DDC in evidence. And we conducted over, I think it was 328 interviews over the span of um, four years. But most of them were conducted in those last two years since 2020. Um, so I'm going to just touch on a very few of the findings, but I'm obviously happy to go into to more detail in questions. So we define data-driven campaigning as a mode of campaigning that seeks to use data to develop and deliver campaign interventions with the goal of producing behavioral or attitudinal change in democratic citizens. Now, this is a very broad definition, as I'm sure you can see. And the reason for that is that we don't think that data-driven campaigning is something that's new. So it's often become associated with the availability of digital trace data and the information that we give away about ourselves online. But you look back to the 1950s, political parties were knocking on doors and writing down what people were telling them about their voting intention. So this is a long-standing practice, and we've seen filtering and sorting of voters. And for us, that's important because it kind of raises the question, well, why are we suddenly so concerned? We kind of need to dig into that and understand what are the problematic practices happening now. 
So in order to kind of ask those questions, in the book, we look at four aspects that we say are central to data-driven campaigning. So that's data, so the actual information part is using, analytics, which is the processes they're subjecting that data to, technology, which is largely how they use the data to communicate with voters, but it can also be more internally facing, and then people. So who's actually involved in this and what implications does that have for how parties organise and who we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about concerns. So I'm just going to talk about very quickly about kind of data and analytics and just touch on some very high level findings. So what does practice look like? And thank you, ChatGPT, for generating all my images for me. Um, so let's talk about data. Data is a really ambiguous word, and it allows us to project a lot of scary ideas in terms of what we actually mean by data. One of the questions that we asked our interviewees was, what is the single most important piece of data that you possess as a political party? And they tended to say two things. It was geographic location data, particularly in the UK, and it was vote intention. Now, we kind of distinguish between four different types of data in the book. So publicly available data, so like the electoral roll, the census, things that have been freely available for years. Disclosed data, so information we willingly give political parties ourselves. Monitoring data, so things like tracking pixels, or it can be internal data that a campaign collects, like how many doors have they knocked on. And then inferential data points. So this is kind of where the modeling comes in. Maybe if you've ever clicked on what Facebook thinks you might like, like what are your political interests, stuff like that. It kind of it's um, inferences based on what people like you tend to like, uh, maybe kind of combinations of, model, of data points to create a model about your um, ideas, this kind of psychometric profiling. And you can see that a lot of the data points on here are pretty basic. Um, they're not hugely intimidating. You know, an interesting point of comparison, you can go on the Conservative Party website, for example, and on their data privacy um, statement, they list all of the different types of data they uh, generally possess about people and the way they get those data forms. They're fairly routine. And there are some more complex things here, you know, browsing information and, and the use of tracking cookies. Um, but it's not as intimidating, I think, as is often depicted in those um, public accounts. So potentially some kind of contradictory information here. Now, I think it, what's often also interesting when we think about data and the way data is held is uh, often in the early literature around data-driven campaigning, there was kind of talk of how there were like these extensive voter databases that held hundreds of thousands of pieces of information about individual voters. So this is a screenshot of the SMP's database, which looks like it's out of the 90s. It breaks all of the time. It's very unsophisticated. Uh, the information that you can input into it isn't really that great. So it also, this is their voter database. They have a separate member database. They don't speak to one another. So the person who showed me this uh, pulled up their own voter record. They work for the party. No information about them in their voter record. So a lot of the kind of technology that parties use is actually pretty clunky. It's pretty old. Uh, the, I, pretty much someone in every political party we spoke to railed against the technology. And the reason is, is like there's not, you can't really use commercial providers because it's so context specific. There's no company that's going to make a voter database that every single political party in one country is going to buy. So they all have to take an off-the-shelf um, piece of tech and then adapt it to their local pur purpose. But that means it's very hard for parties to build comprehensive data sets, and they tend to hold data in a lot of different places, and that can cre create problems in terms of modeling and actually getting the most out of the data they do possess. They do do some sophisticated stuff, and we certainly heard particularly larger parties, particularly better resourced parties in the UK, Australia, and the US, talking about using more sophisticated methods. And we kind of go through a whole range of these. But MRP was something, I think it's been in the news a lot with that kind of big poll that was out recently. Um, you know, it's a really powerful way of taking a lot of individualized data and extrapolating it to project voting outcomes at a constituency level. 
So we, we did hear of examples of more sophisticated modeling, and I've sat and had fascinating conversations with data analysts, I can't wait to hear what Miriam's going to say, uh, about the kind of experimentation and like developing algorithms to look at what time of day you should best vote, uh, knock on someone's door. So there is sophisticated stuff going on. But this is perhaps one of my favorite interviews uh, with Matthew McGregor, who actually wrote a kind of practitioner perspective within the book for us. Yeah. And he was talking about how, you know, he'd worked on a number of campaigns, even in the US, and he hadn't seen evidence of this real micro-targeting and the slice and dicing of voters. He's saying, you know, he totally acknowledges the practical capacity to do that is there, but, and I've highlighted the bit in blue, I won't read the end, but he said, you know, the idea that parties have micro-targeted Gary at number 11 because we've been tracking him, we know he phoned his therapist last, last Thursday and he went to the dentist the day after that, isn't right. And I think we heard this again and again. And it's interesting that some of the computational analysis that's coming out using um, Facebook meta um, data um, is actually finding that most targeting on Facebook is actually group-based rather than very, very individualized. So I'll briefly just show you this. So this is our attempt to kind of explain variation because we did see a whole lot of variation in single countries, but particularly across countries. Um, and we kind of point to a whole range of different factors that can affect the way that data is um, utilized. So a lot of those are party level, like attitudes to campaigning. It really matters who's in charge of a campaign and what their attitude is to data. So I remember in the Canadian context, Justin Trudeau's best mate owns the data analytics company. Uh, and so he was fully into it. And so they did lots of investment in data-driven campaigning. Other parties, doesn't really happen. Regulation makes a massive difference. Um, it controls money. It controls the data that you can even get access to. But there's also systemic factors. So the electoral system has, creates huge incentives to use data or not use data, or it incentivizes you to use certain kinds of analytics and not others. So we think this is a kind of useful way to understand why it varies. So I don't want to go on too long. So I'll just outline, finally, the kind of key findings that we came up with um, that I'll leave you with. So this is firstly that data-driven campaigning doesn't look like one thing. It's very, very varied. It's very heterogeneous. And it can come in a whole range of different forms. It is also not inherently problematic. A lot of this is totally fine. What is therefore interesting is to think about what isn't OK. And I don't think we're yet having that debate. And therefore, it worries me that we're already regulating it. And so I think we need to work out where are those boundaries? And they will likely vary from country to country. It's not new. It's the latest evolution. We're going to see it continue to evolve. So there aren't a kind of clear set of markers that we can point as to this is when it's present or not. And we have to kind of think about the different factors that affect why it looks like it does. And I think it's important for thinking about how we might want to respond as a democratic society, because we tend to rush to regulation, but actually there might be quite a lot of party level influences. We could even change our electoral system if we hate this kind of targeting so much. So I will leave it there, but hopefully that kind of provides an overview of the main ideas. Thank you so much, Kate. A really great introduction to what is an enormously rich uh, and, uh, and detailed book. Um, we, we should give a little round of applause, I think. <laughs> So we move now to two um, shorter responses uh, from uh, Miriam and from Louise. Uh, so Miriam, shall we start with you? And so you're speaking from the perspective of a political scientist and a practitioner. Um, and we should understand that, of course, there are limits to what Miriam can say uh, in her practitioner role <laughs> in a public venue. Uh, but Miriam, great to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so I, I, I read the book, and I, uh, and, you know, I really appreciate the book itself, um, I, I could say is you know, broadly accurate um, <laughs> in how you define you know, practices and how what data is and how it's used. And it's, you know, I pr particularly appreciated the parts where you emphasize how it's A, not new, and often, often it's like overblown. Um, it, it's definitely not new. I remember like my grandfather in, in a small town in Sardinia doing that in the 50s and 60s to you know, knock and canvas. Um, on doors, um, and it's, you know, I, I often feel like there's a big hype around this, um, especially following the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and of course, 
I get it. We should, you know, we shouldn't do illegal things with data. We shouldn't appropriate. That that was a, an extreme case where you know they were appropriating data without consent um, and doing illegal and morally rotten stuff. And you know, we don't. Frankly, we don't need that surveillance kind of system um, in place to do you know to do campaigning um, in a data driven way. Um, so I appreciate the sort of health check, right? That, we're probably re over-regulating and we run the risk, and I think it's a real risk, and this is sort of the first point that I want to make, is like curbing these uh, innovations in how we do data-driven campaigning can actually hurt democracy. I think a lot of the, a lot of the aims, I mean, I, I was, even, even starting doing this as an academic, I was kind of worried, you know, what about polarization, right? Because if you target, if you micro-target, you might actually emphasize the sort of eco chambers. Well, I think, you know, my, my message would be actually, I think this, this achieves the opposite. That the driven campaigning is really done to find A, people that may, may be not very politically engaged, and to the undecided, which then get reached by both parties because both parties might be doing the same, right? Um, you might, of course, want to mobilize your core supporters, but um, I think the key aim is really how do we find the undecideds, how do we find the disengaged, how do we bring our message to people that might be, you know, either too busy for politics <laughs> or even in a, you know, in a situation where the media is so fragmented. Uh, so the, the media diet, the information diet is so personalized because it's no longer the, the age of you know, tele public television ca broadcasts where you could see the political debates. Now, you know, politicians are even taking the luxury of not debating like it was in the Brexit referendum, like choosing not to debate the other side because frankly, people are, not, are tuning out of this sort of political debate on public broadcasting system. So in a, in a hyper plural fragmented media diet, I think campaigns and political parties need these tools to reach the undecided and to, to have their message um, reach populations that might be not interested in politics at all and mobilize, right? So I think it's not, it's not about polarization, it's really about mobilization. And if we curb this just blindly because we're scared of it, we might actually hurt democracy in the process. This is what, um, this is what I fundamentally believe. And the second point that I wanted to make, so even if we think and we assume, oh, this is, you know, doing this, they're doing it with malicious intent, they're surveilling us, they have this surveillance apparatus with like data that follows us and geotracks us every, every minute of every day. Even if we believe that, that there are malignant actors, there, there might be and, you know, actually they, you know, they get discovered and, you know, find. But anyway, even if we believe that all data targeting is that, the second thing that I wanted to say is, on the basis of my research on political behavior, we're not that gullible. We're just not. Uh, we are actually confirmation bias machines. This is what a lot of the research on cognitive psychology and uh, uh, and behavioral economics have, you know, consistently found. Uh, we are not that manipulable. Um, we are, of course, vulnerable to messages that already fit our priors. So that's, of course, you know, if it, if a message fits your prior, you're really easily influenceable in a way, but you are already sort of in a way believing that and you want to believe that, right? So there is this sort of pull of the priors that whenever you receive this new information, you might be very skeptical at first, especially if it's information that goes counter to your priors. But even if you have not a strong prior that you know creates this, this filter, there are other cues that we tend to use when we receive information from political campaigns, political parties, leaders, you name it. And those are generally, you know, the, the sender itself, right? There is a lot of research on like credibility and trust, you know, yes, Gove might, might have said we have enough of the experts, but actually, you know, if you have a long streak of successes in a particular area and those are recognized, you know, prestige bias is a thing, right? And so uh, someone that is trustworthy and credible usually maybe has more chance of influencing you. It's not that we get influenced by whoever. It's like evolutionarily, I mean, a lot of research on uh, cognitive uh, psychology and, and also the, the research from Mercier, it's like evolutionary, it's, it's bad to change your mind every second. And probably the people that did that kind of didn't survive, uh, you know, like, put it bluntly, but evolutionary <laughs> just not good. And so we've developed this sort of, um, um, we've, we've developed this sort of um, filters, right? To, whatever new information that we receive. And the other 
type of filter is really the quality of the message itself, right? Is the message trustworthy in the sense, is it A, believed by the majority, so there is also a societal effect, a societal filter to this, but is, is, is the argument also logical and backed up by facts? Those messages seem to be uh, you know, more persuasive, and it's testament of the fact that we're not that gullible, we're just not that easily manipulable. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so these are basically the points that I wanted to raise and the points that, you know, your book also, mm -hmm. I think, uh, elicited in me and, and, made, and made very clear. So I really, yeah, really appreciated um, the book itself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, lots of interesting food for thought there as well. Uh, now, um, Kate said, I wrote it down, regulation makes a massive difference. Uh, Louise, you're a regulator. Uh, so, what's your perspective? Yes, I agree. Uh, right, thank you. So, yeah, so I'm here from the Electoral Commission, and we are the independent regulator that oversees well run elections here in the UK, but also enforces the UK's political finance laws. Um, actually, I did want to say that I'm really grateful to actually speak here tonight because. Kate's team and the work they do, and particularly the balance that they bring to the argument, uh, is really, really important because the debate can skew simply towards the risks of data. And actually, it is really important to think about the opportunities as well. Now, I'm just going to start off very briefly with some data of our own at the Electoral Commission. Um, you may or may not know some of these, but I'll tell you anyway. In the 2019 UK general election, so the last UK general election that we had, Political parties spent a combined total of £50 million pounds, um, trying to get our votes. In the, late, in the last quarter of 2023 alone, political parties reported receiving donations of £25.5 million. Pounds. So uh, I'll do a little bit of predicting here. With some confidence, I think that unparalleled sums are going to be spent in the general election that's likely to happen this year. Now, I'm just going to pause and think about that general election. As of today's date, there are 338 registered political parties in Great Britain and 30 registered political parties in Northern Ireland. So that's 368 registered political parties that can stand candidates and therefore campaign for your vote in the next general election. In addition to them, there's going to be maybe 50 to 100 of what we call non-party campaigners. So they're not parties, they're not standing candidates, but they are campaigning to encourage you to vote one way or another, for one party, for one issue, whatever it is. And there's going to be, let's say, around four to 5,000 candidates. That includes both independent candidates and those candidates who are standing on behalf of parties as well. Now, that is an awful lot of people trying to communicate with voters, an awful lot of people trying to use data to, to influence how you vote. Now, as, I can, as you probably imagine, they vary hugely in size and also in political impact. A lot of the political parties are what we would call sort of hyper-local, uh, and a lot of the candidates are what I would politely suggest as hopeful. <laughs> but almost all of them will be using data of some form to try and direct their campaigning, uh, to direct the energy they have, to direct the spending that they are allowed to, to do as well. You know, whether it's from the registers, the canvas, bought from companies, whatever it is. But only a very small number of those are actually going to have the money or the infrastructure to take advantage of any complex, unsophisticated data analysis like the type that you're describing. Um, and actually, for us as a regulator, it's more about trying to help those campaigners, help those political parties understand the consequences that come with using that sort of sophisticated data. So I'll touch on some of the things that we've been talking to parties about recently when it comes to the data that they use. I'm going to start with the need to invest in data security and data management. The more data a campaigner holds, the more they have developed their models, the more potentially sensitive information they hold. Now, we all know that data-rich organisations can be targeted by cyber attacks. Uh, certainly at the Electoral Commission, we definitely know that all too well. Um, there are also issues of data ownership, there are issues of privacy, there's issues about ensuring that the spending on the data, it's uh, obtaining it, using it, analysing it, that's all recorded as well. And finally, there's a very big issue for us about how the campaign activity that that data is targeting or supporting actually impacts on voter trust and confidence in the campaign. So I'm going to segue just slightly into that, which is a little bit off topic, but I'm going to say it anyway. 
and just talk a little bit about the challenge of uh, mis and disinformation. I always have to mention it. Yeah. Uh, during last year's local elections in Great Britain, we got concerns brought to our attention or we identified concerns about campaign techniques and information online and in print um, that could be perceived as misleading. You've probably seen some of this yourself. Leaflets and posters that use colours that are normally associated with a different political party or materials that included inaccurate information. We think sometimes accidentally about things like the acceptable forms of ID you can use when voting. Now, these are just the instances that we know about because they're very visible instances. But with the advent of targeting, particularly micro-targeting, and if we get to the stage like we saw in the US in 2016 and, 20, and, and 2020 of very rapid testing and adapting of online material um, you know, during a live campaign, information that's misleading or just plain wrong is going to come and go you know, and we're, we're going to have no way of actually even seeing it as a regulator, let alone providing any kind of reassurance around it. Um, and then you have to consider the challenges that are raised by the rapid expansion of new technologies as well. Uh, I have to mention generative AI. It does use data. It is something that will amplify to new levels what campaigners can do with the data that they hold. They can use it really positively to find new ways to connect with voters, or they can take a person's data and use it to develop a deep fake. You know, they can use it to try and work out what campaign messages are most likely to influence particular voters. That's the point of campaigning. Or they can use it to manipulate people. I'm not suggesting any particular political party would do that. Just let me make that very clear. Um, so where does this take us as the UK's sort of independent electoral uh, commission in a world that now has, uh, albeit fairly basic, big data um, and also has quite complex analytical models that are available for all of us to use? Our aim, and this might sound odd as a regulator, our aim is to promote and support campaigning. It is an essential pillar of our democratic system. So we need to champion campaigning. We need to facilitate campaigning. And we need to preserve public trust and confidence in campaigning as well. That isn't an easy job. And I have to say, on occasions, it isn't made any easier by the parties and campaigners themselves. But the message that we try to get out there about the use of data is simply that with, with the use of lots of data comes lots of responsibilities. You know, for the legislators who still haven't really caught up with the framework here, for us and the other regulators working in this space to make sure that we can help campaigners comply with the law, but also for the campaigners themselves who really need to think about using the data that they hold in a way that is you know, lawful, obviously, but also responsible and transparent, because that's when the opportunities of data-driven campaigning are really going to shine, uh, and we're going to stop talking about those risks, and we're going to start talking about what it can actually achieve for us. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you so much. So, as I said, we will go to your questions in just a moment. Uh, so do keep thinking about what you might like to ask. Um, but before we get there, I should first, Kate, just give you an opportunity to respond to anything that you would like to respond to from Miriam and Louise. And while you're thinking about that, can, maybe if I can just lob in a, a, a particular question as well. So a lot of what we've talked about relates to the the normative questions and, and, and the questions about how we ought to respond and how regulators and legislators ought to respond to these developments. Um, a lot of the book is all that rich empirical material about what's happening in the present. Um, and maybe just a question about that. You said right at the start that um, a lot of the research focuses on the US and the US is an unusual place. So how different, how unusual is the US compared to other countries? And in particular, the UK. How, how, how does the UK compare to the image that we might have from uh, looking at the United States? Yeah, the, the US is so divided. I think, so what, we tend to focus on what happens in presidential campaigns. And there is a massive gulf between what happens between presidential campaigns and like down ballot campaigns. So even kind of for a, someone seeking elections to the House of Representatives, they're much less resourced because they don't have parties in the same way. So all the infrastructure is built around the presidential campaign. When you're going for something lower, like a governorship, you don't have that access. So there's, there are huge, huge inequalities within single parties in the US. You find at the very top, there is an industry that surrounds the campaign uh, being run for the president. So you get a lot of firms, and there are like 
conferences that I've been to where, you know, you'll have kind of 20, 30 firms that are all pitching their latest product. And so there's constant innovation. There's a lot of use of data science. There's a lot of use of like at the moment that everyone's obsessed with AI. But it means that there's all these new tools coming in. And so you see a lot of things being tried. You see very, very like hugely staffed campaign teams. In comparison, I won't talk about kind of current political parties because they're still hiring people. Uh, so please don't have an election soon. Um, but, uh, you know, the last kind of elections, it was quite routine for there to be kind of 10 people working on data and digital within major political parties. The industry of like supportive campaign companies isn't there to the same extent. A lot of them have come from the US and, you know, there's data privacy law is fairly minimal in the US. So a lot of the skills aren't necessarily transferable. The budgets, although that's an insane amount of money to spend on an election, is absolutely tiny compared to what's spent in the US. So the capacity that exists within the UK, even the, the most resourced UK parties, is just a drop in the ocean. And we also then see that huge gap within the UK. You know, the Green Party, I remember talking to their head of digital a couple of years ago, and he said, do you know what? I spend most of my time setting up people's computers. So I don't have any time to do data because they had one person to do the entire party. So it's, you get really kind of different gaps within the UK, but you know, it's, it's a smaller gap here than it is in the US. Thank you. Can I um, take us on then to the, the, the question that I, I think in many ways is, is the fundamental question about what, what should we make of this? Uh, what should, we, uh, should we think there is a problem here? Um, and the sense that I got from your opening contributions was that, um, so all three of you are in, keen to emphasize that balance is needed in this discussion and sometimes uh, there has been a, a bit, uh, well, there's been some hype about the dangers that we see. Um, I think uh, Kate and Miriam, you were perhaps emphasizing rather more the, the, the danger of hype, uh, whereas Louise, I, I detected perhaps more concern um, about where things might be going. And if I can put things very crudely, and you can come back at me, of course, on this, <laughs> sounded like, Kate, you were saying that we shouldn't be too worried, largely because the parties are fairly incompetent. <laughs> and they're, they're just, just not very good at doing this. They now have Miriam, or at least one, one of them does, so, so I'm sure they're getting more comfortable. But, um, but if I can sum up the argument, that, that, that might be a way of putting it. While Miriam, you were suggesting that actually this activity is benign, um, and, and we should welcome it as part of democracy. Um, and maybe if I could just push back a little bit on both of those perspectives. In terms of the incompetence hypothesis, I guess my concern would be where, where are we going? <laughs> so presumably competence increases over time. And in, in addition, in the, 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 the technology, of course, becomes much more sophisticated over time as well. Mm -hmm. And many people presumably will be thinking about AI and what potential there is for AI to make a lot of this much, much more sophisticated. So even if we can be satisfied with the status quo because of the existence of incompetence, might that change? And um, in response to what um, Miriam said, um, I, I guess I, I'm not convinced that the, the fact that people have confirmation bias and therefore tend only to believe the things that agree with their existing um, uh, assumptions and existing biases is all that comforting. <laughs> Because it seems to me that that means that parties can prey on people's fears, their, 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 their deepest worries, in ways that may not necessarily help voters to make informed choices, which you know, fundamentally is in a democracy what we want voters to be able to do. So do you want to respond to those thoughts? Kate, yeah, I think that's really interesting. So I wouldn't say it was incompetence. <laughs> um, <laughs> largely because none of my interviews will ever speak to me again. Uh, I'd say it's capacity. Which is that I think we think that there is a lot of expertise, there's some really good data systems. And, you know, the reality is it's often operating on a shoestring in the backdrop. And that just means that there isn't the capacity to do a lot of the kind of more sophisticated analytics and particularly testing. Like when we talk to people about testing, they're like, we love this idea. But in the heat of a campaign, when there's eight of us, it's just not going to happen. So I think it's a capacity issue. I do think there are some reasons to be concerned. I think 
I definitely kind of lean in onto the we should calm down because I feel like the debate in this space is so overhyped. But I do think there are reasons to be concerned. I just think we need to be really clear about what those are. And that's kind of why, like in the conclusion, we talk a little bit about we really need to have a, a, a more detailed conversation about like what is concerning. So something Miriam said that I'm not entirely sure I agree with is that I don't think that political parties are talking to people who are not engaging. I think they do talk to their own, they mobilize their own voters. And I think they try, they talk to undecided voters, but I do think they neglect significant proportions of the electorate. You know, the, it's a product largely of the electoral system, but there are huge sways. You know, if you're not registered to vote, you are just not going to hear from a party. And as that kind of contact strategy refines, I think we are seeing a kind of two tier um, engaged or unengaged rather than a kind of micro targeted um, discussion. Just finally on AI. The, one of the resource and capacity issues at the moment is there's, they can't generate content fast enough. So you can technically micro-target and you can technically come up with a lot of different segments, but generating the content and fielding that content to all of those different people at once is just too challenging for parties. AI potentially, and it's a bit of a stretch at the moment, but AI potentially opens the door to very rapid, low-cost content generation, which could be tailored to individuals. So it could become actually feasible to do the kind of micro-targeting that at the moment there isn't the capacity to do. I'm not seeing that appetite at the moment, but it's interesting seeing discussions about AI emerging within parties. Thank you. Miriam? Yeah, um, so on the benign... So, and, and cognitive sort of, and the priors and the confirmation bias. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily like, let, let's not say like, let's not claim that everyone is just a benign actor. There are malevolent actors and disinform, like disinformation, misinformation, and all of that can happen. But I think in the context of a political campaign, um, especially in a first past the post system, but I think in every campaign, um, it's, an, it's the incentive structure, right? So it's really the incentive that political parties have. That is basically, yes, of course you want to mobilize the base, so you might talk, to, of course you don't want to ignore your supporters, right? Uh, often they form also a large part of your uh, canvassing and then volunteering teams. Um, but generally what you want to do is like, talk to the undecideds, and those are people that where the priors are not particularly strong, right? So it's like the other, um, the other sort of um, cues are much more prominent, right? So is the message, is the argument strong? Is the source credible? Um, are other pe what are the other people in the community thinking about this? Um, is, is the sort of um, uh, checks that, that we tend to do. So we're not, I, I don't think generally we're not as gullible. And I think that it's not that parties are benevolent or they do that from the goodness of their hearts, we, you know. Um, they might, but even if it was, that was not the, where it comes from, it, it comes from you know pure pure strategy that you need to also cater to the undecideds. You need to have your message come across because you you don't want to preach to the choir. You don't want to preach to people that you know they're never going to be converted in a way. Um, and so it's really focusing on people that might not be attuned to politics that much. And so I think that's good. <laughs> I think that it's not like creating an echo chamber. It's actually trying to get your message across in an, in an efficient way in a, in a moment where the polit political communication has changed, the media has changed. Um, it's very, very difficult for political parties of any sort to get their manifesto across. And so we shouldn't really curb these kinds of you know, statistical analytics that you you use to try to make your campaign a bit more efficient. Um, so it's maybe efficiency is where it comes from if we don't want to you know, use the benign, benevolent <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and I, yeah, I think generally you know, it's, it's really overblown, this, this uh, you know, fear of polarization. And, uh, yeah, and, and we do have these systems in place to sort of not be as manipulable as we might think we are, as some you know, theorists would say we are. Thank you. Louise, what's the Electoral Commission thinking on these matters at the moment? Well, it's an interesting thing because actually when you're talking about benign or malevolent actors, what you're talking about is intent. It's the intent of the person using the data and what they want to do with it. Now, the Commission's in an interesting position because as well as being the regulator for political finance in the UK, we're also a data-driven campaigner. 
We run campaigns to uh, encourage people to register to vote. And uh, over the last sort of six to nine months, we've run campaigns um, trying to raise awareness of voter ID uh, and of the voter authority certificate. And we very much use data-driven campaigning in order to do that because we are trying to target the people whom our data tells us are less likely to be voters or are less likely to be on the register or are less likely to have a form of acceptable ID. So we do it for a good reason, to help democracy, um, and, and therefore it's a good use of data-driven campaigning. I think it is not right to assume that every political party in the UK is using data-driven campaigning in order to try to win votes. I think actually there are probably a number of political parties in the UK who are not using data-driven campaigning for that purpose. Uh, and there may well be campaigners in the UK, non-political party campaigners or candidates who are also doing that. Uh, and this is where I think actually, and I would say this, wouldn't I, regulation needs to be there. Because we, we can sit here as the good people in this scenario. You know, we're the goodies, we're on the light side. But we need to develop a regime that also deals and caters with those who are not. You're being slightly daffic there. Um, <laughs> um, can I push you a little bit further on what they might be up to? Well, I mean, people campaign, people become political parties for a, for a range of different reasons. It may well be because they want to win a seat on a local council or a national election. It may well be because it is a way to further their cause, because they have a political belief that they want to promote. Uh, and having, a having the standing of a political party is a way to do that. You know, with... 368 registered political parties uh, and what is in, to many extents in Great Britain a two-party system, they're clearly not all expecting to win. You know, they're not going into this election thinking, I'm going to be the next member of parliament for. They're going into it for a different reason and it's perfectly valid to do that. You know, you mentioned the Green Party, actually their standing, they may not have a huge number of MPs, but their standing and their ability to get their message across is very significant. Um, but you, you've got to think about the whole range of political parties when you're developing a regulatory regime. You, you've got to think about, this, this sounds really horrible, but you've got to put yourself in the minds of the bad actors as well as the minds of the good actors to come up with something that's balanced across them all. Interesting. Let's go to uh, audience questions. And Rowan has leapt up in order to take my microphone. Um, so, um, Miriam, can I? Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe that, that's easy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we will let you speak, I promise. So, um, uh, I, first hand I saw was over here. And we'll group questions in threes, if that's OK. So I see several further hands. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I've got a question for, for Kate. Um, I was wondering about the impact of the private sector on data-driven campaigning to, like, based on your research and, and experience, um, kind of to what extent do some businesses um, you know, influence this or maybe even collaborate with some political parties in the UK or in the US? Thank you. Thank you very much. And then just a little bit further back. Yeah, I'm going to get some paper. Hi. Uh, question primarily for Louise. Um, you talked a bit about misinformation. What about misinformation that doesn't originate within the political, the formal political system, um, but is intended to influence politics? Um, and just to give a, a, an a, um, anecdotal example, a colleague of mine was at a Labour Party conference and, and got in a cab and said to the driver, what do you make of Keir Starmer then? Uh, and the cab driver said, yeah, no, I you know, fully signed up like him doing good stuff, although that stuff he said about Liverpool today was unbelievable. Like, I, can't, I can't back him after that. And that was the day that a deep fake of Keir Starmer was doing the rounds where he was um, supposed to be slagging off the city of Liverpool. People <coughs> live there. Um, that's clearly just an anecdote, and just one example. But um, if I was trying to influence the political system, I might want to throw quite a lot of money behind that sort of thing. Um, so is, what's your role as a regulator in ensuring that misinformation around political campaigns that doesn't originate from political parties uh, is kept in check? Thank you very much. And then so President Stripey Top uh, towards the back. Sorry. Uh, over here on the other side, right? <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so um, one of the things that was discussed is that we're not that gullible and not easily manipulated by most of the campaigns. So my question is that uh, those people who are like 18, for example, or 19, straight away like going into voting and uh, they don't know much about the world because they haven't really experienced much. So to them, they're only going to get views and like campaigning from, if they hear from one side, they're not going to go home and research all the parties and all the campaigns that they're going to have. So they're going to have like one-sided view and not everyone like does critical thinking and see, so it comes down to, so does it come down to which party has the most resources and is able to reach more and is able to get data of all these people who are less engaged? Great, thank you very much. Um, shall we go in reverse order this time and feel free to pick up whatever uh, questions you want to pick up. Uh, Louise. Okay, so our role in, in relation to misinformation, um, and yeah, I'm aware of the, the deepfake situation that you discussed. There have been others here in the US and in other countries as well. Um, and there's a number of different things the Commission can do, but I think it's really important to point out that this is a much wider issue than just the Electoral Commission. And there needs to be you know, a whole ecosystem of regulators who are looking at this, and indeed we have regular contact with a number of different regulators like Ofcom, the ASA, uh, and others to try and address these specific issues. Now, there are very few, very few laws around the content of political campaigning, whether it's by a party or by a campaigner, or whoever it's by. There are very few laws on that. Um, it is essentially okay for a part of the regime, formal political party, campaigner, um, to put something in a campaign ad that is not true. Uh, that's, that's okay. That's allowed because the law is all about the spending. It's all about the money. It's not about the content. And in a way, that makes sense because political discourse is not as straightforward as, as something being true or false. Um, but what we can do and, and what we do is encourage people to have that critical thinking which was referenced um, to try and help people to reflect on the political messages they see uh, and not simply accept them always at face value. Um, so there's a lot of material that we put out into schools. We do a lot of work with civics teachers, for example, to give them material that they can use to teach about politics um, in an impartial way, because quite often what gets in the way of, of politics being taught in school is people's concerns that they're not being impartial. So we provide material that people can actually go and use to try and, and teach uh, younger people how to do this critical thinking. Um, and we also have a lot of information on our website and have run campaigns about how you can check the veracity of information that you see online. Um, so that's our kind of approach to this, because there isn't really a good legal framework when it comes to political um, campaigning that any regulator can hang off to try and solve the misinformation, disinformation issue. The one caveat to that I will make, though, is if it is about the electoral process, you know, yeah, somebody out there saying, uh, oh, if you want to vote Labour, just so you know, the election's actually on the Wednesday, that sort of thing. Um, there we will absolutely correct it because there's a very clear factual basis for saying that's wrong and we can just say that's wrong and all the social media companies will say that's wrong with us. Just on the point there about the sort of, you know, younger people, uh, whether they're sort of 18-year-olds, new to their vote and so forth. For us, the real answer to that has to be about education. Um, and I mentioned that the work that we do in schools to try and encourage people to uh, teach critical thinking. We also run, in fact, we've just had a Welcome to Your Vote Week uh, where we get an awful lot of schools and community groups to sign up and we try and encourage people to really understand what it means to become a voter. Um, so that it's that education side for us, which has to be the way that we can try and encourage people to understand more about the UK's democracy and about some of the challenges of being a voter and having to, having to really kind of pick your way through it. Just a f quick follow-up, if I may. Mm. Do, you, do you have evidence um, on the impact of that work you do in schools? Because um, being very honest and speaking with my, my students, some of whom are here, um, I don't get much sense that they perceive themselves as having experienced much in the way of citizenship education uh, or education around any of these issues. Well, we've only been doing it for a few years, so uh, that, that obviously may be part of it, I don't know. 
Um, it's, it's difficult because we, we get feedback from the teachers, we get feedback about how they use it, and we do go and talk to students as well about how they use it. But we, we can put the material out there. We can't sort of compel anyone to use it. For us, it's just about trying to put the material out and make it as available for everyone as possible. Um, but if anybody does also want to see some of the materials, they are on our website, so anybody can go and look at them and anybody can use them in a teaching environment. Great, thank you. Miriam? Yeah, so on the, um, on the younger people and the sort of um, manipulability and the fact that... Oh, I think... Could you hear me anyway? Oh, yeah, so my Italian sort of... Yeah. For the video. <laughs> For the video. <laughs> um, yeah, so as I was saying on the question about the younger... I, I mean, it, it, I would say it's not that all young people will be monolithically like misinformed. And there, there is going to be variation. And um, I, I expect that a host of parties might try to target that particular demographic. But I do think I do agree with you that there might be a danger of some parties just having more resources. We know that that's the case. Uh, it's, it's realism, right? It happens in, in, in a lot of countries. And so some parties might be able to, to reach uh, and do data-driven campaigning. Other parties might not. And so that's a real concern. And also, if we make data-driven campaign more difficult, it's probably even more likely that who has more money is going to be able to do it. And other parties might not, because it's just, the hurdles are just too high. And so there's also a risk in over-regulating in a way, but the other bit of, of that question is really regulating financially, right? Ensuring that all parties can have the resources to actually do that, can actually access the type of data um, that, that Kate uh, has, has, has outlined. You know, that, that should be sort of a level playing field. Like, so I, I agree with you, that's a real, uh, a real danger. And I really welcome these uh, education campaigns because mm -hmm. it, it goes back to what I was saying about our as having these sort of filters for plausibility and these accuracy motivations in a way, sort of trying to emphasize those is usually the best, um, the best technique against misinformation, right? Oh, okay, this, this vote is really, really important, right? The election is really, you might think it's not, but it's important how you vote and then you need to make the right call. And sort of like even something simple like that can trigger the sort of accuracy motivations and then these critical thinking filters popping up, um, right? Even in the context where you don't feel particularly one way or another, and so you might be more prone to manipulation because you don't, you don't have strong, strong priors, but still you have other filters that you can use, and if you can elicit like this critical thinking and accuracy motivations, this is a really powerful way, I think. Um, but it, the way it's not to basically curtail the, you know, the, the campaign activities of parties because that, it's beneficial for democracy that they can you know, run campaigns and reach people with their message. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Kate? I love your question about parties. Uh, so, uh, companies, rather. Um, so it's really hard to find this out. So I spent a year and a half opening every single invoice that was sent in to the Electoral Commission and hand coding it to find out what money was being spent on at the last election, because your 10 categories are very out of date. Uh, um, me. Uh, <laughs> the UK Parliament's 10 categories. UK Parliament's 10 <laughs> categories. So there's nothing about, so the electric, every invoice that goes in, over £200 to the Electoral Commission has to go into one of 10 categories. One of them's like advertising, but there's nothing that differentiates spending on digital or data. So we came up with our own coding framework, um, and we found that 18% of spending is going on like digital and data infrastructure. So it's not actually a huge percent, like most money still goes on like printing. So. Um, we then kind of looked at the different companies that and the categories that money is being spent on within that. This data is all open access, uh, so if anyone is interested, just come and ask me and I'll send you the link. Um, so, like, most of that goes to social media companies, um, to Facebook, uh, programmatic advertising as well, uh, which I think is not talked about often enough, but huge amounts of money goes on. Um, it's much harder to study. Posters, so MRP models are, like, crazy expensive. Um, so it can be like 70, 80 grand uh, if you pay an external um, polling organisation to conduct them for you. Um, Labour Party last time round used an organisation called Data Praxis to do data modelling, which is an excellently informative uh, description in the invoice. Uh, Conservatives paid like 160,000 CTF for research. Um, but it's kind of, we know from other sources they were likely using data. So the companies are playing a role, they're supporting activity, and they often provide specific expertise that a party doesn't have itself. Um, the only other thing I'll say is on, on the point that was uh, asked to Louise about, 
what the Electoral Commission's obligations are around misinformation. I feel like in this debate, we so often neglect politicians' responsibilities in regards to misinformation. In the Netherlands, political parties sign up to a code of conduct around campaigning conduct where they pledge to not make misleading um, claims with statistics, mm -hmm. to not use like very fine-grained targeting. Political parties in the UK just are not interested in having that conversation, and I think that is a real shame. You hear. Uh, second round of questions. So, uh, Rowan, gentleman right at the back, and then further forward. Well, thanks very much. Th thanks very much for the invitation. Very enlightening. Just one thing, to quick, quickly, Louise. Do you think you could add a category on your voters list? None, none of the above. <laughs> no, no, to get to the point of my questions, could all four of you answer this one? Given the uh, parliamentary sovereignty, do you support parliamentary sovereignty or not? Yes or no? And two, given that uh, statutes are written in law, should they be con 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 substantiated or otherwise in a mathematical formula? Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Uh, going slightly beyond the remit of, of the panel, but so, um, um, gentleman just here. Thanks so much. Um, uh, first things first, I absolute, as somebody who's spent um, lots of years doing advertising. I really like Kate's suggestion that we shouldn't believe the adverts of the advertisers. I think that's a, a, a really, really, really good point. Um, I, was, I wanted to come back to the point the gentleman over here made about non-party campaigning. Um, so I, I had the good fortune to work with a, a, a splendid colleague who's a Hungarian speaker in 2015 during the refugee crisis. And she was, uh, her, her social media feed was absolutely thick with frenzied, hideous, anti-refugee propaganda. Clearly, most of it lies that effectively gave Orban a majority. You know, it was straightforward um, uh, 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 manipulation of an election by non-party actors. Um, or notionally non-party actors, so outside of the democratic sphere. Now, and, and I think, so confirmation bias is prejudice bias, and that's manipulable. Um, so I wondered if, it, it, so if we're not going to act on that now, is it something we should be acting on? Because it is affecting our elections. I'm, I'm sure of, can't academically support that assertion. Um, and uh, the other question I was just going to ask is, when does this uh, video become available? Sorry. Uh, I'll answer that one straight away. Video will become available hopefully pretty soon. Uh, um, we've got a little bit of a backlog at the moment, but um, we'll, we'll... And having signed up for the event, you will get a notification of when it comes up. Can I just see who's still wanting to ask a question? Shall we try to do a mega round here and mm -hmm. then uh, see what we can answer? So there's a gentleman there and then in the middle and then at the front. And if you can try to keep these points quick, 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 that would be really helpful. Yeah, thank you very much for the... Uh, for the uh, sorry. <coughs> can people hear me? Or do I need a shout? That's good. Um, thank, you for the, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your work. Uh, I want to start by saying that the, the GDPR in this country requires people to uh, hold the data lawfully uh, and, and for it to be accurate. And that causes a huge challenge when people use um, third-party data to augment data which is freely given. Uh, in IT security world, it's called an inference attack or a jigsaw attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question on that like, the dimension is, um, how can you say it's not a big problem when uh, this is still happening? I, mean, I can bring up examples. I'd be, uh, the, the other aspect of it is, is we don't know what people are doing. There is no transparency. So I'd be fascinated to know what the Tories spent in the Copeland by-election on Jeremy Corbyn's views on nuclear power. Um, but we will never know. We don't know, we'll never know. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is that, the question I'd like to ask is that uh, uh, if we are confirmation bias machines, that really suggests that uh, no effort is going to be placed in persuading people to change their minds. And that, to me, is a threat. So do you agree that that is not a bigger threat to democracy than um, the possibility of uh, uh, ensuring that people Know, know that you're on their side. Thank you very much. And gentleman in the black top in the middle, just here. Uh, yeah, thanks. I guess my question's mainly for Kate and Miriam, uh, given their opinion on kind of the moral panic around some of this technology and approach. 
what do you think, well, why do you think it's been such a moral panic? Like, what's caused it to be so widely accepted that this is a big issue? Um, especially if people are kind of hard to persuade, like, why were they receptive to that message? Like, what's the deeper incentive at play here? Interesting question. Thank you very much. And finally, here at the front. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, the, there were a couple of mentions regarding sort of institutional incentives regarding data-driven campaigning. So my question, and the electoral systems were, were mentioned a couple of times in that. So what are the particular incentives into how does data-driven campaigning manifest differently under different uh, systemic in, uh, infrastructures, so under, for example, different electoral systems? So how would it, it manifest differently under first past those relative to a different electoral system, for example? Great, thank you very much. So lots of questions there. We have six minutes left. So uh, try to keep it to a minute and a half each. Um, Miriam. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess a, a couple were on the uh, confirmation bias, the Hungarian case. Also, I would say, yeah, that, that situation with the anti-immigrant, uh, you know, messaging catching like wildfire, as you depicted, I, I, you know, that's an anecdote I, I'm not familiar with, but I'm sure, you know, given Fidesz and their rhetoric. But I, I would think um, in the Hungarian case, it's, it's less likely that you can hear as an undecided, as a person that doesn't maybe have very strong priors on the immigration issue. So a person that is already anti-immigrant would, of course, buy into that really quickly. A person that is not wouldn't. And then the sort of in the middle will only see one, one of the sort of campaign non-political and political because of the institutional, I mean, Hungary is just a peculiar, you know, <laughs> political system, right? Um, and we have um, other kind of, another kind of political system um, over here. Um, and so, of course, we, we know that there has been censorship and, you know, opposition has been curtailed in Hungary. So all of the systemic Things have to be looked at, um, I think. It's not just, you know, it's a confirmation bias that is driving it. It's like the undecideds don't hear both sides, um, which I don't think is the case in, in most um, advanced democracies, right, when political parties can, can target. Um, and I, I think it all comes down with the resource imbalance, right? We should ensure, uh, on the question ab about the panic, why it's the panic, it's also the transparency, and people are scared, right? And then it's sort of, I don't want to be pried over, I don't want to be to have this surveillance machine, and these Cambridge Analytica-like companies, of course, publicizing that it's a, it's a weapon, it's a strong weapon to look cool, frankly, <laughs> and the lack of, of transparency, or, or maybe a level playing field um, is, the, the, the biggest problem, I, I think. And so we should allow basically everyone to, to do that, the driven campaign, right? That's, that's sort of um, where, where, I would, where I would stand. Thank you. Uh, Louise. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and rattle through some of these. Um, I would not permit a party called none of the above to register because it would be against the provision to uh, hinder electors in um, understanding of what to do with the ballot paper, so sorry about that. I do believe in parliamentary sovereignty. The Commission is accountable to the UK's three parliaments. I'm very proud of it. I have no idea about mathematical formulae and statutes in law, so I do apologise for that. Um, the issue of sort of manipulation by non-party actors. Now, I'm somewhat controversially going to leave foreign actors out to one side here, because that is very much a matter for our colleagues in the security services rather than the Electoral Commission, which has a UK-based remit. The way that actors come into the regime of political finance, and it is a finance regime, depends on what activities they are spending their money on. So, I mean, we talk about sort of, you know, formal or, or people within the regime. It is actually, what are you doing? And if you're doing certain things, you're in our regime. So if you are not a political party, but you are encouraging voters to vote for a particular political party or a party that supports certain issues, you're in the regime. Um, so the key there is how do we enforce that regime? How do we make sure there is transparency about the spending on these kinds of, of um, adverts? How do we make sure that people actually know who's behind them? Um, because when they're in the regime, <coughs> there is uh, a requirement to give us names, uh, including the name of a responsible person that, goes, um, that, that can be made public. Um, enforcement is a challenge. It is a challenge to find campaigners 
Um, it is a challenge because we don't have the powers that we consider we need to have in order to get behind some of this information and find out who's posting it. Um, and it's a challenge because there are loopholes and, and ways of, of um, you know, getting into the political finance regime that we would rather weren't there, uh, like sort of company donations coming from overseas, for example. So I don't, I don't want to sort of go too far on this because we do have a very transparent and a very secure political finance system, but there's more that could be done in order to make enforcement easier and to make the regime um, more transparent and to put additional safeguards in. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk about that sort of in a separate point, um, a separate time about what can be done. Um, but ultimately, it all depends on the UK government doing it. Thank you very much. Final word to Kate. Uh, so on the GDPR issue, I think this is a... We don't talk about it in the book because it's really, really hard to study. So the concern that I have is when external companies are used to build model data and political parties don't know the foundation of the data that the model is being built on. And I've spoken, I've tried to do a lot of interviews with the companies that are used by parties to kind of do that modelling. And unsurprisingly, they don't really want to tell an academic what they're doing. And there's very little oversight. And a, a real challenge of studying this entire area is it's very, very difficult to actually like, ascertain and, and verify uh, exactly what is going on, um, but particularly around the sources of data and the foundation upon which that was gathered. I think it has massively tightened up since the ICO report, but it's very challenging to be able to say categorically that there aren't problematic practices. So it's something that we should be concerned about. Um, but... I think it requires the ICO to take quite a proactive uh, response to actually look into it. Um, on the different, date, different systems, so a kind of really obvious example is compulsory voting in Australia just totally changes the game because they've got no mobilisation operation. So they don't need to do that targeting in that way. Whereas in Germany, because of like the transferable vote, they actually... Um, it kind of changes the dynamics of who they're trying to win support from. So rather than it being quite a tight group, it's kind of a tight group, but then you, know, you need to build those coalitions, you need to win people's second preferences. So it kind of changes the constituency of people you're talking to, but also the type of messaging that you need to test because you're not just focusing on one narrow group of individuals. So kind of, those are kind of the electoral ones. Uh, and then finally, to bring us to a close, why is it a moral panic? I think a lot of it is technology. So one of my favourite anecdotes is that there's some really great evidence that uh, when envelopes were invented, there was like a huge panic because it was like people are going to be sending secret information <laughs> in like you can't see it. And with every new technology, there is this huge concern. It's happening now with AI. And I think we kind of move on before we've got the evidence about what's actually happening or on to the next thing. So I think technology coupled with a lot of dissatisfaction about politics at the moment means that it really captured the public consciousness and I think that's really resonated and is now quite firmly entrenched in when people think about this stuff. Thank you so much. Sadly, we are out of time. We could go on for much longer, but we cannot. Before I ask you to join me in thanking the speakers, let me quickly note that the next policy and practice event will be on China's economic diplomacy, and that will be in two weeks' time after Reading Week on the 22nd of February, and you can sign up for that via the Department of Political Science website and Eventbrite. If, if you don't already, please do follow us on, inter, on Twitter or Instagram. Our handle, the Department of Political Science handle, is UCLSPP, uh, for mysterious reasons. We announce all of our forthcoming events here, and I think we tell people when the videos are out as well. Um, and you'll also be able to keep up to date with our latest research. But most importantly, you've all been fantastic. Thank you so much for a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>